Tonight on EWTN Live, we'll be talking about the dignity of human life and end-of-life issues with two very special guests. So please stay with us. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. Before we introduce our guests, I want to mention that today is the feast of the truly great Saint Irenaeus of Lyon. He's known for, about his city, Lyon, where he was bishop, but he was actually born in Asia Minor. And he studied under Saint Polycarp, who was a bishop who had studied directly under St. John, the Apostle, for 20 years. And I urge you to read St. Irenaeus' book. You don't need to read so much the first two books. He describes the various Gnostic heretics, and they're really boring, like most sinners. They are boring, but when you get to book three, four, and five, you see another sense of him laying out the linkages between the apostles and the subsequent bishops in Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Rome. And then he lays out the books that are in the Bible, as well as the New Testament anyway. And he tells us about the faith that reaches from India to England. And this is a very important uh, theologian in the early church. He died around 202. Uh, A.D., and we urge you to not only seek his intercession, but also to study his writings. Now we have two guests who are very much involved, as we all should be, in upholding the dignity of human life from conception to natural death. They're working together to raise awareness of these issues in the media and in the church. So please welcome the brother of Terry Schiavo, whose struggle for life played out in the courts and the media 12 years ago. Also, uh, Mr. Bobby Schindler, uh, her brother, and the Archbishop of Philadelphia, the Most Reverend Charles Chapu, are here to discuss these issues from a very personal uh, aspect. So please welcome our guests. Welcome. Okay. Welcome, Bobby. Good Thank to have you. you. Thank you. Excellency, welcome. Thank Good you. to have you here, both of you. Um, you all were here a couple of months ago, about two and a half months ago or so, to celebrate a Mass on the actual anniversary of the death of your sister. And that was, she died 12 years ago, correct? March 31st, 2005, that's correct. All right. All right. So here, well, something I'd like you to do then is, um, because... A lot of folks don't remember all that happened. Some do, but there are a lot of younger folks who may not remember. Give us a little bit of the background of what happened to your sister and how she died. Sure. Um, well, thank you uh, for having us, uh, Father. Sure. Um, Terry was uh, uh, 26 years old, a uh, perfectly healthy young woman. Uh, our family was living in St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg, Florida at the time. Mm, nice and, town. Yes, yes. And... Uh, uh, I had received a call in the middle of the night from my father. Terry and I lived in the same apartment complex. She lived there with her husband. Uh, I was living there and said, something happened to your sister. My dad received a call from her husband. So I was there within minutes, and uh, when I got there, Terry was collapsed on the floor. Uh, I wasn't terribly worried. I saw Terry earlier, and she was fine, um, but uh, she was struggling breathing. Uh, anyway, when I reached down, told Terry to wake up, she was uh, unresponsive. Paramedics got there and I knew right away there was something seriously wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so they couldn't find a pulse and um, um, really worked on her for, for quite some time to stabilize her enough to get her to the hospital. 
from that collapse that is still unexplained, um, Terry went several minutes without oxygen. And at that moment, she sustained a, a brain injury, uh, really um, uh, a, a profound brain injury. Uh, at that point, became dependent on others for her care. But uh, she was in the hospital. Uh, it was touch and go. Um, we didn't know if she was going to live or die. Uh, she you know, eventually did s survive the, that initial collapse. And then... And um, was, whatever caused the collapse, did you ever find out what that no, was? No, no, we, we still don't know what, what was the cause of her collapse. Uh, but it wasn't the collapse that caused the brain injury. It was the lack of oxygen right. later. Subsequent to her collapse, right. uh, she went to some type of cardiac episode. And, mm -hmm. and that's what caused her to go without the oxygen, which uh, subsequently led to her brain injury. And she became dependent on others for, for her care. Uh, at that point. Um, but mm -hmm. she wasn't in a coma. She wasn't brain dead. Uh, she wasn't on machines. She wasn't terminal. Uh, she was a woman who had a very serious brain injury and had difficulty swallowing because of her brain injury. Mm -hmm. And because of that, she needed a feeding tube because okay. she wasn't able to eat on her own. And that was the only thing keeping her alive was, was food and hydration that was fed to her through her stomach. Uh, but absent that, uh, she was a, a relatively physically healthy woman with a very serious brain injury that needed rehabilitation and care. And, um, and that's what we were providing for her in the beginning of this, uh, of this um, situation. Was this brain injury closer to the stem? Uh, or it, did it, they ever find out? Yeah, well, actually, um, her stem, the part of her stem, my understanding was still intact. And, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was other parts of the brain that sustained the, the injury. Yeah, the, the, but the, they the were damage. the areas that controlled we're swallowing this possible. Yeah, different parts of, uh, sure. of her brain. So, yeah, um, that, but, but, but that, that from, from that emerged really the, the battle that began between uh, Terry's husband, who was appointed her guardian. In the mm -hmm. beginning, he was caring for her and providing her aggressive rehabilitation. In fact, father, in the beginning, not a lot of people realized, but Terry was starting to improve. I mean, she was in, she was in uh, um, physically, she was in, as I said, she had the severe brain injury, but she was starting to uh, form words from the rehabilitation, mm -hmm. and she was responding to that uh, therapy she was receiving in the beginning, those first couple years. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, after two years of this type of rehab that we we're providing for Terry, Michael decided that he was going Michael. to... Michael... I'm sorry, oh, her Shiva. husband, okay. who was also appointed a guardian, and he was the one in charge of her medical decisions. He decided that he was going to stop Terry's care and then it was around, this happened in 1990, incidentally, uh, February, I don't know if I mentioned that, uh, so long, quite, quite some time ago. Somewhere around 1992, Michael decided he was going to stop the care he was providing for Terry. As guardian, he was able to do that. And that's when he went on a pursuit to try and end my sister's life. And that's when our family was in a position now of having to defend and battle to try and protect Terry from her husband, who was trying, in essence, trying to kill her by taking away her food and hydration. Yes, yeah, so, and, and he was not trying to do uh, active harm to her, but he wanted to withdraw this, the feeding tube? That's correct. So, okay. so um, that she couldn't accept any nutrition. Right, which would lead to a death by starvation yeah. and dehydration. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, people need this. There, once this got out into the media, and it started really to snowball uh, from, from the time Michael petitioned the court in 1998 for permission to remove Terry's food and hydration. And that's when um, our family obviously uh, was doing our best to defend and stop this from happening. And it, it just really started snowballing into this, this media event where it became not only a national but international media um, uh, event. And that's what people, when, when I've talked about this you know, before, you know, right. earlier uh, in the week, um, people remember that. You know, that right. That's the part there. But the, a lot of the information about what led up to it was uh, media didn't always right. make clear what the issues were. And, and we're still doing that today, Father, quite yeah. honestly. I mean, so much of it got distorted during this battle that, that uh, there, there's still to this day inaccuracies and things said about my sister that simply aren't true mm -hmm. uh, about her condition. And, and it's all done in an effort, I think, to, to, to legitimize what happened to her and to because, co and so continue what's happening today. 98. He starts, uh, Michael, her husband, began going to the court system. That's correct. And that continued on until? 2005, when it culminated. Uh, March 18th, 2005 is when everything, um, you know, all of our efforts by our family, uh, we were unsuccessful. And that's when Terry's feeding tube was finally 
we moved. And then by the order of a judge, by the order of a judge, Pinellas Court Judge George Greer, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it was removed on March 18th. And then uh, about two weeks later, March 31st, Terry Terry died by uh, dehydration and starvation. Wasn't that judge involved in some way in some group that was promoting uh, euthanasia? Well, we we never we were never quite sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but but there were a lot of things there, that were that's, happening. That's one of the things that the yeah. media was saying. There was there was a lot of things happening, Father, at that time that just didn't make sense, and it just mm -hmm. seemed like there was just a tremendous effort to end my sister's life, and and our family just didn't. We were naive. I mean, we were just an ordinary family, and we're involved now in this battle that we're dealing with people that were, you know, part of the euthanasia movement, uh, mm -hmm. very influential people and, and organizations, and. Yeah. Uh, and our family was just trying to do our best to bring Terry home and protect her and, and care for her and love her the way she was. Yeah, but they, the, the judge ordered, and because she's married to right. Michael, he had more say than you did uh, under That's the correct. law. And, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but in response to Terry's death organization, that's what we see. I mean, we see guardians, they potentially have a, an enormous amount of power when it comes to mm -hmm. caring for, for mm -hmm. their ward or for their loved one, whoever it might, right. you know, they might be in, entrusted to care for. I certainly hear that often. Mm -hmm. And even when there are two guardians who don't always agree, right. this, this is where things get into sure. very difficult situations. So, so, the, so that happened then, uh, uh, she, she uh, died on uh, March 31st, 2005. Five. That's correct. Okay. So. so, yeah, 12 years ago now. Wow. Excellency, good to have you here. Thank you. Uh, worth for our viewers to know that you're also a member of the Board of Trustees for EWTN. So you have more than passing interest. Right, I'm actually the longest serving member of the board. Yeah, so you, I go back to the, my earliest memory of this room is when I sat here with Mother Angelica and she grilled me when I was a young bishop of Rapid City, South Dakota. Well, see, and um, you know, I'm, I think I'm the longest uh, uh, running guest on the show. Time creates that and time <laughs> fixes it. <laughs> That's true. That's really true. I'm facing my own end of life issues you know, <laughs> in a different way. Yes, you know. yes. I, I had a problem with that last year um, with a heart attack. So, um, yes, you know, then it'll happen again. The, uh, but that's why it's also very important for us. Right. It, it's not just that we're cranky old guys, but we are facing situations we may face such situations right and it, it and eventually everybody will die now you, we don't know in god's mercy we don't know how but oftentimes other people are involved in decision making and some people have more control of decision making than we will that's why these things are important tell us a little bit about some of the issues morally Right. Uh, concerning euthanasia? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to remember that this was not an end-of-life issue until after the courts got involved because Terry was uh, living, and, and she was living a, a you know, a impaired life, but nonetheless, she wasn't dying naturally. She, she did not have a terminal disease. No, she didn't, and it wasn't until after the feeding tubes and the hydration were removed that she began to die. Mm -hmm. uh, so... The beginning point of this was a, was a decision to let her die. You know, one, one of the things that the church is dealing with today is the issue of euthanasia, which uh, it's based on a Greek word which means easy death, and it refers to uh, efforts to end people's life when people are suffering or in difficult circumstances. Um, traditionally, they refer to two kinds of euthanasia. There is active euthanasia where you deliberately uh, kill someone, uh, you know, or assist with their killing. And the second part is called passive euthanasia, where you just let people die because you don't give them ordinary care. Mm -hmm. And the teaching of the church is that because of the dignity of every <clears throat> individual and because God is a sovereign over life and death, uh, we don't have a right to take someone's life. And we have a duty to help them preserve their life through ordinary means. And uh, the church sees eating and, and uh, uh, hydration as ordinary means. Mm -hmm. And people sometimes say, well, 
you know, eating with a tube or drinking with a tube is not ordinary. Well, it, it is ordinary. I mean, it isn't expensive to do that, for one thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we use forks when we eat. And, you know, they, in the beginning, they didn't have forks. So we use tools. Well, that's, that's we use tools. That, we use uh, tools to feed ourselves. We use glasses to drink, which are instruments we use for food and drink. And uh, a feeding tube and a hydration tube could be seen in, seen in the same kind of way. So when the church... Uh, says ordinary, it, it, it means the means that uh, people would ordinarily see as, as uh, the way we should care for one another. Mm -hmm. uh, that you know, if it becomes extraordinarily expensive or extraordinarily burdensome for the person who is in the, the state of uh, uh, suffering, uh, it might be, there might be circumstances where you don't use extraordinary means, but we're required for the and, ordinary means for the preservation of life. And by extraordinary means, um, there, there'd be a number of things. For instance, um, somebody who is, ha uh, my grandfather had uh, a rapid series of strokes and they, he, he was 95 and it was one stroke after another and they kept resuscitating only for another stroke. Oh, right. I, it, that, at that point, that becomes an extraordinary means. It becomes burdensome yeah. for the person who's dying, right, actually. Right, right. You know. you know, when my my own mother, she lived to be 97 years old, and uh, towards the, la the last 10 days or so of her life, she would pull out the feeding tubes, even though she was she was not a, in a terribly conscious state. And, uh, you know, the, the, the liquid would just accumulate in her body. She I think she gained... 40 pounds in the last week of her life because her kidneys weren't working. Exactly. So in circumstances like that, it's unusually burdensome for the person, so mm -hmm. you just don't do them. But ordinary care, you know, helping people to giving them a place to sleep, you know, caring for them, washing their bodies, helping them care for themselves in that sense, food and drink, all those are ordinary means right. by which we show our love and concern for other people. I mean, uh, we certainly dealt with that uh, with Mother Angelica herself. Yes who had experienced a cerebral hemorrhage and needed a lot of care. She was blessed to have sisters that loved yes, her. It was beautiful. Taking great care of her uh, until the very end. You know, so this, in, this, that's ordinary and, um, and, and she could swallow. She, was in not, she wasn't in a difficult well, Pope, situation. Pope, Pope John Paul II was, was placed on a feeding tube uh, the very day Terry died and then uh, died two days later on April uh, 2nd. Uh, so, go, yeah. um, so he was uh, showed how to die in a dignified way and, and he received a feeding tube to receive his food and hydration at that time. Matter of fact, that was one of the witnesses I think he gave is right. how we age and age, exactly. uh, you know, toward, toward death. Again, death is inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is something that uh, our systems run down but how the, the dignity oftentimes is not only how the person carries him or herself, but how the people who love that person care for him or her. Dignity is a relationship and not just some datum uh, right. out there. This has become a major issue, not only for your, your sister is one person, but now we see 13 states this year are trying to pass laws for euthanasia. That's why this is serious and why people have to speak up. How do we address some of those concerns as it affects the law? Either one of you. Well, uh, if I may, um, actually, Father, that you're speaking specifically about assisted suicide, uh, physician assisted suicide, uh, and the state's trying to uh, legalize that, so to speak. Right. Uh, the issue with my sister, we're talking about food and water. And, and to go back now, where, where our bishop was saying, where food and hydration through a feeding tube is ordinary means, mm -hmm. at least as Catholics, we believe that. But something very, very, um, uh, um, what's the word? I, uh, very harmful to people that are like my sister, uh, back in the 80s, uh, food and hydration, food and water through feeding tubes was reclassified where it was once believed to be ordinary and basic care was reclassified as medical treatment, extraordinary care. That was basically, if, if you will, opened up the floodgates for healthcare professionals to deny it to people like Terry. So who made that change? There was a case in California uh, uh, 
forgive me if I'm mispronouncing, it was Believa versus, uh, I believe, the state of California. And in that case, it was when they first recognized uh, food and hydration as medical treatment, as, as artificial life support. Once the medical profession determined food and hydration through feeding tubes so as such, it now became legal in all 50 states to deny it to people, even if they're not dying or if, if, if they're in situations similar to that of my sister. So that's the issue our organization that we formed really focuses on. We, we, we haven't been so much involved in the physician suicide issue because we see this food and hydration issue as much more of a serious uh, problem that's mm -hmm. happening in our healthcare system today than the, than, than the assisted suicide issue because countless people are dying the way Terry died, by dehydration and starvation, by having the denial of care, denial of food and hydration mm -hmm. in the same way Terry was. And it was all done in this one reclassification of how we look at food and, and hydration and how it's classified. Incidentally, Pope John Paul II in March of 2004, one year before Terry died, uh, really took the steps to clarify, and, and, and many, we were told this was a response because of all the confusion that was happening in Terry's case, to clarify church's teaching with, with what Archbishop just said, uh, when it comes to food hydration, how we're to treat people in conditions similar to that of my sister. Someone who is not dying and is able to assimilate and metabolize food hydration, then we are morally obligated as Catholics to care for these people in those types of situations. Father, when I, was a, when I was a young boy, people would never have thought of denying food and drink to the people who were sick or in this kind of situation. But there's been changes in our culture, and uh, they're very serious changes. Uh, the thing that worries me is that uh, because of technology and uh, our fascination with science, we seem to more easily move in the direction of uh, kind of struggling with or even denying God's plan of creation. You know, we can do things that could never be done before. Um, you see this most clearly exemplified in, in the culture's understanding of the change, the meaning of marriage. You know, that the common understanding of marriage is the love of a single man for a single woman, faithfully for the sake of having children. Uh, which It's just a common understanding of marriage. Now, you know, as our culture has changed, uh, we feel like we can change that. You know, even though it is the pattern given to us in the Bible and in, in the story of creation, that uh, we don't have to do that. We can do what we want. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing's true about transgenderism, you know, that uh, God may have given us the body of a male, but I, if I want to be a female, I have a right to do what I want. Um, so this rebellion against God's order, God's plan, uh, is common. It's, it's part of the, it's in our bloodstream because we're descendants of Adam and Eve who argued with God about who could decide what's right and wrong. And I think this issue of, uh, of euthanasia of assistant, uh, physician assisted suicide, both of those issues mm -hmm. are, are acts of rebellion against the plan of God. That uh, you know, we used to think that God will decide when we are born and when we die. Now we can make decisions for ourselves. We can even choose, we can choose to have our children born in, in test tubes. Uh, we can, or not born, but to be conceived in test tubes. Mm -hmm. And we can make a decision when we're gonna die or when someone else is gonna die. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the loss of, of, of of understanding that God is in charge, we're not in charge. And of course, all that has led to a devaluation of human beings. You know, you would never think of killing your mother or your sister or your wife in the past, but people do that now. And they do it under, they say it's merciful to do it. Uh, well, see, that's the, the thing. That's why I brought up uh, the, the euthanasia laws, because what's happened in Europe is that they have expanded mm -hmm. to include situations like your sister, sure. where it's not necessary for the victim to approve of suicide, so that it's no longer suicide, it's homicide. Right, right. And uh, uh, there was a case in Belgium where a tw parents of a 12-year-old decided that the child should die, and so they, it had assisted suicide, but it wasn't. The kid didn't agree to that. The parents did, apparently. Right. And so it, it's, that's my concern. It's, um, we, we talk about this when we get to uh, the, the government and the military and mission creep, that they start off with one issue and they expand to a whole war. This is something that I think the assisted suicide and the, the issue of care mm -hmm. are becoming amalgamated in the popular mentality. 
and people are willing to, are, are more and more willing to kill. And I also look back, I'll never forget the interview that um, uh, uh, Rep. Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi had done on ABC News, in which she said, we have to include abortion and birth control in the health care bill. Think of all the money we'll save. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. She was talking to George Stephanopoulos, and he tried to help her walk it back, but she didn't know. She insisted. The first year of life is the second most expensive year of life, medically speaking. Your last year is the most expensive. And if they want to save on the first year, they'll want to save on the most expensive. Sure. That's why these things are connected. In the minds of a lot of politicians, the government takes so much care, and oh, we can't afford it. Uh, sorry, you know. So we want to give ourselves permission to kill you, and also with we, your permission, or perhaps without. Right, and and we've kind of contributed to that by no longer caring for the elderly in our own homes. Right. You know, even the elderly even think they ought to move out of our home into a nursing home because we're they're an imposition on us. So you know, it used to be that you took care of your, your parents and your grandparents Absolutely. when they got old. Exactly. Yeah. And now you farm that out, and if you don't want to pay for it, you farm it out to the government, and then the government makes decisions how long you're going to do that. Right. And that's dangerous. Now, you and your family were taking care of Terry in the, this, uh, during her disability time, correct? Uh, at times, that's correct, Father. Yes. Yeah. And that, and that was her purpose. husband was also. Right. We were working with Michael to, to, to provide Terry the mm -hmm. best care possible mm -hmm. back in the beginning of those first couple of years. And, mm -hmm. and our family never suspected uh, that, that Michael would you know, take this position now of, of uh, uh, trying to uh, end Terry's life. And, mm -hmm. and it, it just shocked us when, he, when we received the letter letting us know that he was going to try and remove her food and hydration. Mm -hmm. So... But, uh, they had they'd had a good marriage and all that? Well, it... it <laughs> yeah, it, it was, um, there, there were signs that, that things were, weren't going well uh, no, okay. towards, towards uh, when, you know, just, just before Terry's collapse when, mm -hmm. in, in 1990. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and, and that might have led to, to perhaps you know, some of the, um, you know, of what might have happened to her that night, but we were never able to, to come to any type of conclusion, yeah, sure, you know, sure, what, what caused that. But, but, but I, you know, I, I you're absolutely right. You know, what, what's driving all this is cost containment, uh, Father, absolutely. And, and the assisted suicide issue is, is very serious. And there's some great organizations out there that are, and particularly the disability uh, movement, the disability community, is fighting very hard. And they've been somewhat successful. I mean, not, maybe not even somewhat. They've been uh, pretty uh, uh, success, you know, very successful in really pushing back the efforts of the assisted suicide movement. They've had some success. Uh, this, these last couple of years with uh, California and Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. um, but, but nonetheless, uh, they've been able to stave off a lot of the, the uh, this assisted suicide movement initiative. But, but, but the other issue of right. hydration right. and nourishment. That's what nobody seems to be paying attention to, mm -hmm. and that's what you know, our concern is because of the amount of people it, where it's so easy now to deny the denial of care. And, and again, what is what is motivating? What is pushing all this? Well, I think there's a lot of things, a lot of dynamics involved. The, the, the dignity of the human person. You know, I think abortion has has played a big part sure. into this. Um, if it's if you can convince a mother right. to kill her own child, I think we're being naive. Then you can kill a child right. to kill his or her mother sure. or father. But, but I think ultimately, you know, it's cost containment. I mean, assisted suicide. The, the reasons behind that are cost containment. The denial of care that we saw with my sister and, and others like her. It, it's all. It's all motivated by, uh, the, you know, the, the um, you know, wanting to save uh, cost. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, look, we have to take a little break. Sure. We're going to come back in just a couple of minutes. But there is the National Crisis Lifeline for end of life questions, and you can call them. Their number is one eight five five three hundred. Four six seven three. Eight five five three hundred four six seven three. Uh, or you can go to the uh, website uh, lifeline at lifeandhope.org. 
lifeandhope.com. Lifeline at lifeandhope.com. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes and continue with this conversation. So please stay with us. Thank you, thank you, and welcome back. Uh, first of all, I want to invite you to come and be part of our uh, audience here for the live shows and the other programs that we have. You can do so by contacting our pilgrimage department, 205-271-2900. Uh, or you can go online to ew10.com and Look up pilgrimage there. They'll give you information about the scheduling of masses, scheduling of programs where you can be in the audience, and directions to get up to Hansville so you can go up and pray with the sisters as well. Uh, plus, good places to stay and good places to eat. We always like to feed you well down here in Sweet Home, Alabama, get you some good barbecue and all that other good stuff that I used to eat. <laughs> 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 but uh, we do love to have you come. Dylan, you ready for a question or two? Sure. Come on, let's start off with a question. Sir, where are you from? From Philadelphia. Aren't you some? So, <laughs> where's the cheesesteaks? <laughs> so, no, I can't eat those. <laughs> so, what's your question? So, you're talking about the, both the, the past and the sort of future of our laws and our culture. Um, but I'm curious, you know, every day Americans are in the hospital, every day people, families uh, are facing um, not just end of life issues, but really life issues, uh, broadly speaking. Um, and so while we're facing things like assisted suicide and whatnot, maybe in the future in certain places or on the ground in states already, uh, aren't Americans facing euthanasia on a practical level already every day? I mean, aren't these issues here whether they're legal or not? Gentlemen? Well, I, I can just uh, attest to we've been doing this for 12 years now with our nonprofit, and absolutely, I mean, the calls that we're getting from families, uh, undoubtedly with the food and water issue being mm -hmm. reclassified, you know, just that one change in language uh, with um, uh, the assisted suicide uh, issue uh, with cost containment, uh, the calls that we're getting, they're, they're quite chilling, Father, and, uh, and, and families are, are calling us not knowing what to do to protect their loved ones. So we're seeing... Um, you know, all, all forms of denial of care these past 12 years that, that I think people just don't realize are happening in our health care system today. You know, I don't know if I have an up-to-date uh, directive for my own uh, community, my own faith community. It's important for us to have those drawn up legally so that we can give instructions to the people that uh, love us on what we want to happen mm -hmm. to us when we get in situations where we can't make decisions for ourselves. But it's also important for us to make sure that our elderly parents or grandparents do the same so that they're protected from overactive uh, uh, medical folks who don't have the same values that we have. So I, I think it, it, would, it would do the members of the, of the audience well to, to make sure they plan for their own future and their own care and the care of those that they love. And one of the things in those, uh, those are called what, living Advanced wills? directives or living wills. Uh -huh. or, one of the issues is that most people, especially folks who have been parents and have been caregivers to their parents and children, I don't want to be a burden on anybody, so mm -hmm. don't give me that hydration and stuff. Isn't it also the case that we have to make those living wills on the basis 
of Catholic moral principles and not on what the culture says Absolutely. to us is burdensome or not. Absolutely. There are good organizations like the National Catholic Bioethics Center that do have forums that embody Catholic teaching on this matter. If I were the pastor of a local parish, I would invite experts to come in and have workshops for the people of the parish so they know how to plan those directives mm -hmm. for themselves and their loved ones. I think it's something that uh, people don't spontaneously understand. You mm -hmm. know, they do. People today have begun to see uh, hydration and, and nourishment as extraordinary means, and they certainly are not. Yeah, and and I think the issue that some people feel, I don't want to be a burden, as if while we're a burden, we're of no longer any use to society. Right. That's the mistake. Uh, I remember a sociological article back when I was an undergrad uh, that pointed this back in about 68, uh, it pointed out that societies that killed off their weak tended to become more violent societies. Societies that cared for the weak members tended to be more gentle. And they, they point out that Sparta was a classic example. Any disability, that child was executed uh, up until age seven. You know, and uh, Romans would do that a lot too. Uh, the defect of being a girl was enough for a Roman to put him out for the wild wolves to eat. So this was, you know, uh, uh, what they meant by defect uh, was wide ranging. And one of the things that that said to me then is the role of disabled people in society is to help make the healthier folks more gentle and more caring. And it evokes from us, you know, a giving of care, even when it's inconvenient, but it makes us more humble and better people to do the things that, you know, as I said to my own mother in her last illness, as I was carrying her to the bathroom in the middle of the night, uh, I said, Ma, you always said paybacks are hell. You walked the floor in the middle of the night with us, and now we're doing it with you. <laughs> right. Well, but that's what you do. Right. Well, whenever, when, when is it ever not a burden to be in a relationship with another human being? You know, we were burdens to our parents when we were born for many years. I th imagine most husbands at some time are a burden to their wives. You know, we worried about when we're burdens and when we're not, we wouldn't have much of life because... Some of us who live in communities. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so part of love is carrying the burden of uh, caring for another person. And we should be uh, anxious and, and willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Every year in the Archives of Philadelphia, we have a mass for people with disability mm -hmm. and their families. And I'm called to preach at that mass every year. But when I go, I receive the sermon from just looking at the congregation. Here are people who are extraordinarily generous in caring for people with disabilities. Thankfully, the church in Philadelphia has been very generous in helping them do that. You know, we have homes for people who are severely disabled, uh, but, but the parents still come to those homes, you know, and they love their children, and they show us what it means to be a real human being. The difference between us and uh, the animal world is that we care for the others, even in difficult circumstances. Right, right. And I, I can't tell you how many families have come up to me that that for whatever reason have put circumstances have put uh, a person with a disability in their lives and they're the ones that feel blessed. The ones that are taking care of these people, they feel like God has blessed them to put this person in their life, to put them in a position of having to care for them and show them unconditional love. So it's really transforming for a lot of families. And, and what are we saying, Father, when, when, when someone is saying they don't want to be a burden uh, and we're saying, okay, let's legalize suicide, we're basically validating their worst fears, right? We're, we're telling them, you are a you burden, are a burden so we're yeah. going to make it easier for you to kill. And as, my, as Wesley J. Smith, who many of you might know, says, whenever we start using killing as an answer to suffering, then there is no, there is no bottom. I mean, where does it stop? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what's happening in our society today. We, we use suffering as a reason to kill, as legitimizing, uh, you know, rationalizing, justifying killing people. And I think it's, it's growing worse, and that's what scares and frightens me. Father, Bobby was a teacher before this 
happened to his sister. What were you teaching? Uh, high school down in uh, Tampa, Florida. What, what so, subject? Uh, math and science. Math and science. <laughs> cool. So. But he had a vocation that rose from the circumstance uh, and has become, a, has become active in a very different way. I think he ought to tell us the story of his own vocation to what he's doing now. Yeah, what, what, uh, uh, are, you, are you no longer teaching? No, it'd be a good time if the audience wants to take a nap, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, we don't want to do that. Well, I was teaching, and, and obviously our family, when we got kind of thrust into the situation. Um, I never expected to be doing what I'm doing today you know, when, when this was happening with my sister, but in response, our, our family formed the nonprofit because we didn't want other families to have to experience what our family experienced. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to kind of try and be an organization uh, resource for people to turn to for support uh, and, and for help uh, if they find themselves in, in, in a circumstance where someone's trying to deny care to their loved ones. And we try to educate and, and raise awareness, clarify uh, you know, w what it is, as, as, as Archbishop was saying, when, when it comes to um, um, you know, caring for these people, when it comes to feeding tubes, when it comes to uh, um, you know, exactly what it is, um, how we are to treat these people in these types of situations. So uh, we never expected to be as, as busy as, you know, we just said, okay, here, here we go, let's see, see what happens. And it's just been, you know, ever, ever since we started this in 2005 after Terry's death, we've just been getting just calls and calls and calls. The, the, more, the more families on, uh, uh, see us out there helping, the more calls that we're getting. And it's just, as I said, it's, it's, it's frightening the type of calls that we've been receiving, uh, really speaking to what's happening in our healthcare system today. And, and I, I don't want to paint... A, a broad brush here and, and say that it, our healthcare system is, is failing or, or we have a terrible, we have one of the best healthcare systems in, in the nation, but, yeah. but there's a lot of things that are wrong with it and, and they're targeting pe the medically vulnerable uh, uh, to, you know, as, as we said, for all these reasons that we're mentioning here today. Do you think your sister's death has made you a better Christian? Oh, absolutely. It's, it, I was a fallen away Catholic I, and uh, my sister's situation brought me back to my faith and uh, is really responsible for, for where I am today. And uh, Could so. I ask this? Were you fallen away partly because you were in, in science? Did that sort of make you skeptical of the faith? Or was it just other issues? Yeah, I, uh, I think it was just I became secularized, if that's the right word. Mm -hmm. uh, just caught up in, in what I thought was important in our culture, which I think mm -hmm. so many of our kids are today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I see it uh, every single day. Uh, but but from from my sister's tragedy, I, I've been my family, me, I've been blessed in so many ways. The people that I've met, the relationships that I've formed, the friendships that I've made. I was single for almost 50 years. I met my wife through this this movement, and Is that uh, right? uh, she was uh, um, had just uh, went through a death of her of her spouse, and uh, you know, meeting her, I uh, being a bachelor my whole life, I married her and married into. Uh, a family Wait a minute. Of nine. Are you trainable? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm that's sure. always my question to the woman. So you have to ask her that. Nine children. <laughs> well, yeah. Nine children now. I went from uh, being single my entire life to having nine kids and three grandkids and one I do. So uh, my, <laughs> my life changed, and we're so blessed to have you. You hit have, the jackpot. Oh yeah. Well, Archbishop, he he presided over our ceremony and he married us. So uh, so uh, countless blessings that have come from my sister's tragedy, and we're just fortunate to be in this situation now to help others because of what my sister Terry went through. How old is the oldest of your stepchildren? Gosh, uh, going on 30, I believe. I, 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 I still don't know all their names. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, the youngest you is uh, better be. <laughs> uh, little, little me. She's uh, almost 13. Okay. So, all right. so that, that's, a, that's a wide range. Oh, it's, it's been quite a, yeah, quite a change. My life has gone, gone on a lot of changes. And, and this made your life worse? <laughs> of course not. Okay. It's been uh, wonderful ever since. <laughs> ever since. So, but it's been busy, a lot busier. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. No, no doubt. And plus, the, this other ministry that is beyond the classroom. And uh, you know, I taught high school and university mm -hmm. both, and it's a wonderful, wonderful vocation. But you know, you get you you can be taken way beyond that classroom to, uh, uh, in one sense, the classroom of the nation. Right, right, and that seems to be what you've done. Well, I, I, as I said, Father, I never expect to be placed in this position, and I'm very humbled by being in a position to try and help other families now. And we've been 
rather successful in, 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 in really preventing the deaths of, of a lot of individuals, uh, just being able to advocate for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's only, as I said, because of what Terry went through that we're, we've been placed in this position. And, and if, if we have one message really, uh, when we're out there speaking, when we're doing our speaking, is, is people need strong advocates because um, when they're placed in these situations, they really need to know their rights because people today don't know their rights that they have when they're in these types of hospital emergency crisis uh, types of circumstances. Yeah. And then if they don't have strong advocates, um, they, they could be put in a position that uh, they don't know what to do and how to provide the best care. You, you haven't told us the name of your organization or how to uh, contact you. Well, it's Terry Schiavo uh, Life and Hope Network. It was named after Terry, and it's the... Uh, Life Terry Schiavo Life and Hope, Hope Network. Network. And it's lifeandhope.com. And we do so, have... So, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's the address right. that, uh, on the Internet that I gave, lifeandhope.com. And we do have a crisis lifeline number where, where families can call us if they're in a situation where uh, they need our help and support whatever it is that they're looking for. We, we try to provide them that help depending on what the situation might be for, for that circumstance. See, this is something that I think is uh, another important component that uh, w when you said, Excellency, about the, um, you know, getting people to stand up for and advocate, we're talking about folks you know, becoming, uh, like we used to speak about it with confirmation, soldiers for Christ, right. that we're not waging war against mere flesh and blood. But I'll never, I never forget uh, when I hear of murder and, uh, and terrorism, the words of Christ in John 8, that Satan was a liar and the father of lies, and a murderer from the beginning. When you say that, uh, or better yet, redefine mercy as, well, I'll kill you. We call it mercy killing. Mm -hmm. You've defined mercy the way Satan would. Yes. And it's a satanic element that sees death as your friend. When you look at Sirach cha chapter 1 and also at Wisdom chapter 1, you see that death is God's enemy. Yes, Wisdom 116. Death is God's enemy. Christ, you know, it, 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 in 1 Corinthians 15, says Christ will put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy is death. And here when we see people saying death is our friend, whether abortion or taking away hydration and, and nutrition. They have allied themselves with Satan and against God. This is a, a, an important element. It's not about political parties and such as that. It's about allying yourself with God or with Satan. And this is something very, very important to understand. Same thing with terrorism, murder. You align yourself with Satan at that point. Right and against God. And we have to keep this very much in mind as you know, the, 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 it's a spiritual battle you're calling people to, to advocate and stand up like adults, men and women who are strong soldiers of Christ, you know, by our confirmation. That's a, with Pentecost not that far behind us, we ought to remember ourselves now. That's right, you know, the, the rebellion against God's sovereignty is a characteristic of our time. Mm -hmm. And assisted suicide and euthanasia are clearly that kind of rebellion. And you know, when we were baptized, uh, you know, we're, we're told that we become priests and prophets and kings mm -hmm. in, in, in alignment with Jesus, who is the king, the mm -hmm. prophet and the priest. Mm -hmm. But you know, part of that prophecy means having the courage to be God's clear spokesman, his soldiers in the battle for the culture. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, uh, people are characterized negatively when they're referred to as cultural warriors. But, you know, Jesus was a cultural warrior. You know, his first words of preaching were, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Change things, the kingdom of okay. God is at hand. And we have the duty to do that. So not only does, does uh, Bobby have the vocation of uh, proclaiming this truth, but we <coughs> all do. You know, every Christian has a responsibility to be God's spokesman in the world around us, to your family, to uh, your friends and your workplace, to the broader community. And we need to speak up and stand clearly with the church on the issues of uh, physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. 
even when we talk about ourselves as Christian warriors, the, that passage I just cited, that we're not fighting against mere flesh and blood, but against the powers and the dominions right. and the forces of darkness from Satan, that describes the, the outfitting. All the weapons are defensive. The virtues that are defensive, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, uh, the uh, shield of faith, the only offensive weapon that is given there is the Word of God as a two-edged sword. Right. Amen. And that we're not going to, that's why, well, you, are you advocating blowing up abortion clinics and euthanasia people? No. 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 That's not one of the, we're not given bombs. That's another religion. They blow people up. We don't do that. Our offensive weapon is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I like about what you're doing is that you're helping people, not only with you know, the scriptural basis, but you're giving them knowledge about the issues so that they can be well-informed advocates who know the issues medically and legally. And that's, a, a, that's an extremely important service trying, in a democracy. Well, we, you know, we, we try, Father, and, and, and never leaving, falling far from our faith either. I mean, we, our faith gives us the tools to fight against Satan mm -hmm. and to, to, uh, to stay strong in this battle. I and mean, we have a daily mass, we have our sacraments, the, uh, the Eucharist, the confession, uh, all these things that, that we're able to use to, to keep us strong every day. And, and I think as Catholics, we need to remember that, the Divine Mercy Chaplet. I mean, all these mm -hmm. uh, things that we have, these tools to fight against Satan and, and to stay faithful and strong in this very, very serious battle. I, the, the life, the protection of life, the dignity of life is, is, the most, is the most fundamental battle I think we're facing today because mm -hmm. there is such an attack on life. So we need to yeah. stay strong and use these tools that our Catholic faith gives us um, to, to be strong Catholics and this, you know, stay healthy in this uh, so-called, in, in this fight that we're, in, we're involved with right now. Well, I, I always like to point out, we've been engaged in the secular and atheistic governments of the world fighting against God and life for the last hundred years. You know, World War I, starting in 1914, you know, 20 million people died mm -hmm. for secular issues, 50 million in World War II. The atheists in communist Russia killed 61.9 million of their own people. You know, they, they've been, the, the atheists in China were even worse. You know, at least 90 million so, uh, of their own people. And this it goes on and on. The atheists in Cambodia, half the population. They constantly, the secular and atheistic people, have sided with Satan. And they see death as their ally. And we have to stand up against it in this country. Uh, they, you know, we, we see that uh, they try to put us into freedom of worship instead of freedom of religion so that we just stay inside our little churches. But you don't seem to be that kind just stays inside a cathedral church and pontificates. You get out there. Well, I do go to the cathedral every week for mass and professions, but I do find uh, it necessary to call the people of my church to be the ones out in the marketplace. Exactly. You know, the, the role of the, the bishop and the priest is to encourage other Christians to be Christians publicly and not just privately. And I hope my ministry will always do that. And your ministry as well. Again, I want to mention it. Uh, let me lay this out so people can go and look up and sure. can, you know, engage you better. Um, it's Terry Shavo Life and Hope Network, right? That's correct, Father. And the, it's lifeandhope.com as the, the website. That's correct. And you can also call them if you have questions about uh, end of life issues and sure. palliative care and all that. Uh, it's 1 855 300 hope. Uh, 1 855 300 hope. Uh, and you, you spell out hope on your phone, whatever those numbers might be. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think it's 4673, I think. 4673, there you go. <laughs> See, he knows. Well, good. 
Well, thank you both very much for being thank here. You, thank Appreciate you, that you came here for the mass back in uh, April, and uh, glad to have you back here to do this very important program. Excellency, would you join me in giving a final blessing? Yes, here? certainly will. Almighty God bless you and keep, keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we can have such guests and deal with such topics of importance to us all only because this network is brought to you by you. As Mother Angelica had set it up, that you keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay all our bills too. Thank you.